and we are live. We are up. So, and we're going. How's it going tonight, Christopher? You doing good, man? I'm and good, Chris. Thank you. Or morning yeah. over there in Japan, right? It is. What time it is, is it? There? It's 8.30 in the morning, and if you need to know the Wordle word of the day for <laughs> June 15th, because I'm a little ways ahead of you, I can I can give you a hint. Nice. Well, uh, don't spoil it for me, but, you know, but uh, I like doing it on myself. I got a good strategy for it, too. I mean, this is not what we're going to plan on talking about it, but I got a good strategy for it, I feel like. And I do pretty well now. Okay. Do you have any specific strategy do you use? I always start with with as many vowels as I can in okay. my first word. Okay. So um, I use the word adieu, and then that that gets rid of everything except for the O and then the sometimes Y, and you can kind of triage it from there. That's kind of what I do. So I have three go-to words, and roughly probably eight out of ten times I can get all five letters by using these three words. Okay? Do you want to know the secret? Do you want to know my, my strategy? Yeah, well, yeah, I do. Okay, so all right, so – uh yeah, I guess I'll give it out for everybody. I've been trying to like <laughs> my own little secret, but I'm sure it's really not. I'm sure that I stole it from other people. Just listen to them talk about it. So there's three words. And the first one, well, I hmm, I go, uh, I change the rotation in them. So the first one is I usually go crest. Okay. Okay. Then I go nymph, which is like you were saying, I get that Y. Okay. Okay. And then the last one is audio. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. and if more times than not, I can get at least all five letters in the fourth try because it's like, oh, just got to figure out. The oh, then it's got to be this. The scramble, yeah. Gotcha. That's clever. I like that. Yeah, it works pretty well for me. I'm on a good streak right now. So. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't worked every time. There is one I only got one letter out of those three, and it was a nightmare. But I got Oh, geez. It. Yeah, bro. But anyway, we didn't come here to talk about <laughs> Wordle. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, man. So what little I know about you, man. You seem like you've been doing – um. They're like I don't know, I don't know if crazy is the right word for it, but you're uh, out there grinding and doing big things. You know, you, I've noticed you're uh, started as a what craft beer in Vermont started there. Now you're working on your PhD. You also teach a little bit. You got your own. Is it, I'm gonna pr- mispronounce it. Hanaku, Honkaku. Honkaku. Okay, Honkaku <laughs> like spirits. I mean, yeah. I mean, what what happened? Like, let's get the little dive in on the story, man. How did all this come about? Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Um. Hello, everyone. Christopher. Bell- Christopher Pellegrini at your service. I live in Tokyo, Japan, have done so since September of 2002. So I'm on year number 20. And I am an insufferable craft alcohol nerd. Okay. And that journey started back when I was a teenager in one of my classes when I was in high school, a US history class. I was supposed to be researching prohibition for a school project, but while doing so, I learned that everybody back during Prohibition was making alcohol at home. And I said, huh, how do you do that? So I researched that. That turned into a home brewing hobby when I was much too young to really be doing so. (laughs) Uh, I had a secret home brewing operation out of my bedroom closet, even printed labels for my, for the beer that I was making and uh, made some okay beer over, over a couple of years secretly. Mm -hmm. Uh, eventually got found out because a hey, news to the world, when you brew beer in the kitchen, it, it gives off quite the aroma. And eventually I got found out, um, was uh, filleted for that. But then I turned that, that experience into an apprenticeship, quote unquote, at the local microbrewery called Otter Creek in Middlebury, Vermont. Okay. And stroke a wild ass luck, I... I I mean, you could call it luck for me. It was lucky for me. It was unlucky for the brewery. Same calendar week, we lost two brewers. One wrecked his back, lugging heavy bags of grain. So he was like horizontal for two months. The second guy, same week, left the state to join the circus because he wanted to be a clown. As you do. Okay. And so then little, I think I was 17 or eight. How old was I? I guess I was 17 at the time, 18 year old me was the last man standing. And all of a sudden I went from, you know, learning about uh, the, all of the different processes in the brewery to being the number two brewer. Okay. And taking the night shift at the, at the brewery and, and being the youngest commercial brewer in the United States, I was too young to legally drink what I was making, of course, but that fired up in me an immense passion for these handmade small batch drinks that I carried with me 
well, I carried it with me to Spain and then to South Korea. And then I eventually boy meets girl and girl wanted to live in, in Japan. So I followed her over here and we've been here ever since. Uh, I love living in Japan. You're right. I, I have uh, I was a, a university lecturer for a long time. I am doing a Ph.D. in geez, I'm regional and and international bioresource economics, which is a really long winded way of saying that I am in over my damn head. <laughs> and uh, but that's kind of part and parcel with my extreme enthusiasm, enthusiasm for Japanese indigenous spirits, the ones that you drink, namely shochu, S-H-O-C-H-U and awamori, A-W-A-M-O-R-I. These are Japan's, as I said, native spirits that have been around for well over 500, in some cases, 600 years. And they're fascinating and they outsell sake here in Japan. So I have now, um, I have, uh, I co-own a company in Japan called New York Wine Traders of all things okay. that imports, exports alcohol. Primarily the reason why I love it so much is it gets Shoto and Awamori out of Japan. And then a more recent company in New York called Honkaku Spirits, which you mentioned before, which is importing Shoto and Awamori from Japan into the US market. And that started in March of 2020, which was a heck of a time to quit your full-time professorship <laughs> and start a you know and uh work on a startup but hey you know sometimes we make these these crazy decisions at crazy times and the whole world changes and it's amazing yeah man it's, it, well it seems like it's working out for you so far i mean you seem happy like i said you're doing big things i love the whole you know boy meets girl and you, you know boy follows girl i love that thing because you never know where life is going to take you and it's a fun adventure sometimes and i think that's probably one of the main theme i if there was a soundtrack to my life the name of the soundtrack would be curiosity and i think it would be all about hey i don't i don't know how that works and i can't easily find the answer but i'm probably not going to bed until i do and that has led me all over the place and i you know, a lot of people, it's almost cliched now to follow your passions. I guess for me, it's just follow, following my curiosity. Mm. And the harder it is for me to find the answer, the more excited about it I get. Sure. And I think that perfectly encaps encapsulates how I became such a big fan of Shochu and Awamori. Yeah. I mean, I love that, man. Your curiosity and you're also kind of challenging yourself at the same time if you don't know something you want to figure it out and like you, you'll do whatever it takes to figure it out and oh, you know, i will put myself through the ringer and a lot of people yeah. listen you know, say fuck it you know whatever i'm just going to move on and figure it out later but yeah we need people like you yourself you know <laughs> out and learn new things and broaden you know your horizons and you know do you know and take a chance on something i mean you know taking a chance you never know how you know moving to another country that's a big deal for a lot of people i've never been out of the country but yeah, well, look, man, look at you're living in Japan and loving it. I it's a uh, it's not for the faint of heart. I will I will say that one of the fun things about I mean, you get the same emotional roller coaster from from joining a new company, any new community that you join. At first, there's like this honeymoon phase where you're just in love with everything. This is great, bright eyed, bushy tailed, and then there's this quick drop off yeah. where you're kind of like, oh, geez, I'm this is I'm um, like. The stuff that's different is starting to irritate me. And, and then you get into this kind of, then you kind of get into this up and down wavy thing where you're kind of, you're having good days and you're having bad days as you, as you really, really work your and muscle your way through it. And then eventually you get to the other side where you're mostly kind of on the incline again. And it's where you've kind of internalized and dealt with and, and adjusted to as much as you can and kind of compartmentalize things that you don't feel you can adjust to. And that's very much the same roller coaster that you deal with when you move to a new country. I mean, the stuff that hits you first, the obvious things are going to cause shock, culture shock, of course. Uh, of course. Let's state the obvious at the beginning of the things you can you can see and taste and and smell and touch and hear. Those things will immediately start to affect you and your mood and and every your ability to sleep soundly. And then later later after you sort of get used to that all of the deep stuff is going to start keep affecting you like i still have culture shock from one key point i've been here for almost 20 years 
One thing that still kind of rubs me the wrong way is the social hierarchy that's built into Japanese culture and Japanese society, whereby people who are older than you or people who joined a community or organization first automatically are afforded respect. Mm. And down to the point that it affects the endings of your verbs in Japanese so that you are speaking to them differently from the way that you speak to people that entered the community at the same time or at the, at the same age as you. And it's, it's really just, it's very, very different from what we're raised to cherish in U S culture, which is basically it's a meritocracy in, in theory, it's a meritocracy. Uh, we, it's not based on age or, or your, you know, the time that you've put in necessarily, although that does matter in certain cases, I agree, but here, here it really is first and foremost it's you know hi nice to meet you what's your name and then okay can i figure out how old you are so i can figure out how i use my language with you and that to this day because i was in the in the university system for close to two decades where it's super super ingrained was a, a situation where i was just biting my tongue all the time like i have a an eighth of a tongue left it's really really difficult to to, it's just been completely bitten off. <laughs> well, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, bring you on the show and talk to you. I mean, not only because, you know, I'm a whiskey guy and I drink it. I'm not an aficionado by any means. I just kind of know what I like and let's drink. And I want to talk to you about that. But also yeah. you know, the culture of living in Japan and just – and I guess we can start there first since you just touched on it because – and I don't know how much insight you might have on this or thoughts, but and kind of saying what you were talking about, how older people seem to get more respect over there, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as a leadership model, so for example, um, Yokohama Tires, I used to, they have a plant over here near me and I used to work okay. there. And they actually ended up building a huge plant. Um, I'm, in, I'm based in Virginia. So they ended, they ended up building right. another plant in Mississippi. And so, but what happened was, you know, long story short, that, you know, the Japan headquarters, I guess, didn't like how Mississippi was going. So they came over there and they started to gut everything, but started from the top as a leadership model. So it was like anybody who was at the very top, they started just taking them out little by little like there and then putting in new blood that way. So I was just wondering uh, if that was part of just, you know, how Japanese leadership works is that, you know, they start at the very top no matter what. And they said that this is the issue. And then we changed from the leadership for the leader part of it and work its way down. That's a that's a great question. The one really interesting um, pushback on that from a Japanese perspective is the labor law over here doesn't allow you to systematically remove people like that unwillingly. Oh, um, labor rights are so strong here. It's very difficult to fire people who have attained a, a level in the company. Uh, meaning, no, just that that sounds like they've been there for a certain number of years. If they have a full time job, and it's a contractual it, they're like they're part of the company it's really hard to remove them if they don't want to be removed okay now there may in the states uh, we know that it's much easier to to move given the conditions of the economy or or what the company is trying to do if it's trying to pivot but uh so it's it's really interesting to hear that they came in and started just like okay you're out we got another person yeah. port in there that that in and of itself would not be easy to do in japan Okay. Um, so I find it interesting that they, they, I don't find it interesting, but I, it is poignant that they went that route, something that they can't do in Japan, uh, which is fine. I mean, you gotta, you've got to localize your approach to everything, no matter where you are in the world. So the way they address that problem in Mississippi would necessarily be, be very different from how they address it in, if they have a plant in China, or if they happen to have a facility in Germany, it would be different in each place, obviously, given the laws and the culture. Um, but I, I, one thing that's one thing that they do just, I don't know if anybody out there is thinking this is like, well, how do you get rid of somebody that doesn't want to be in the company anymore? And this is kind of a, this is not a, a, a lovely, um, window into the work culture here, but they'll just bully the hell out of you. Um, so they will try to get you to quit because that's the oh. best way to remove somebody. You just make their life so miserable that they quit. And so I've heard of. I've heard of situations where they take uh, somebody with a decent job and they put them in the basement and they make them do photocopying in a windowless room all day, mm -hmm. every day, for, right. until they just have had too much. And then I've also hear, heard of incredibly, remarkably stubborn people who put up with it. And it's like, well, I'm not going that easily. Good luck. If this is a battle of attrition, you're not beating me. And I knew an executive at a, at a company 
here in Tokyo who couldn't get this person to quit that they was not a good fit for the company. So they, this company paid to have this particular employee, they paid like 80% of his contract to have him work somewhere else because they couldn't fire him. <laughs> so they continued, to, they subsidized his employment at an, one of the, this was a big company and they had like this subsidiary. Okay. They shoved him over there where he was fine. Uh, by all accounts, he he fit in. They had a better work culture over there and that really matched his personality and he was fine. But 80% of his salary was paid by the parent company. <laughs> That's wild. I mean, it's, you know, it's almost like that's a, a baseball thing where, the, you know, some teams actually pay other play, uh, yeah, play, pay other players for another team on just a contract because they don't want them that much. That's how much they hate that player being there. And yeah, just got to get some of that guy's contract out off the books. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I know you talked about culture shock just for a minute. And and by mm. the way, with uh, that shot or that place in Mississippi, that was probably three to five years ago. And I don't really know. I guess it's still you know, in working order and working condition. I don't, I don't really know how everything went it's, out. If it's still there, I'm sure it's working. Yeah, I'm, yeah, it was a brand new plant. They poured a lot of money into it. So I'm sure it's still probably doing okay. But but yeah, yeah that was like, you know, I, well, where that came from is that I had somebody real close to me who was actually in the higher up there working and he actually moved, you know, his whole family out that way to, you know, start a whole new life and get this plant going. You know? Uh-huh. And he was... And then... Yeah, they came in like, nah, dude. So... Yeah. But that's, um, that's wild. But yeah, so that's, I guess, my, you know, moving on from there is, um, so, I mean, you know, like I said, I know you said it was a culture shock, but, you know, as far as business and, you know, ver America versus Japan, was that tough to get a hold of? Or just after 20 years, it was just kind of now it just comes natural to you and you got it down. Well, it's it's a lot easier now. And, and it was trial by fire. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is the the language barrier. And I don't I, I think that would be super logical for anyone to hear. If you don't speak Japanese, then there's a significant barrier to a whole bunch of stuff that you want to try to do over here. And um, and yes, there are significant differences between business culture in Japan and in the United States. One that I often come back to is is the what a lot of folks say. I mean, what, I work in two different teams. I help manage two different companies in two different time zones. One in Japan, one in New, in New York, and so it's really interesting the culture of the two teams with the with very similar goals mm -hmm. who rely upon each other. They're they're not connected financially in any way, but they they um, they do work together to achieve similar goals, and it's really interesting to to hear the differences in the conversations. Whereas in the United States, states a very common refrain is, "Well, it doesn't hurt to ask." There's no harm in asking. You know, we hear that all the time. You might as well check and see if it's okay. You know, you're trying to get better pricing or you're trying to get more favorable payment terms or whatever. You know, businesses are built on favorable terms. But in Japan, asking to go back to something that's already been decided can really hurt to ask. You can do damage to the trust that has been built or between yourself and whatever, whoever your counterpart is. And that's a really, really different way of looking at things. America can be a lot more wheeler dealer, a lot more like, let's just, let's get our heads together and see if we can figure this out. In Japan, there's a process. And if you've already uh, fed the process enough to get to a point where you've made a decision, that decision generally tends to stand. And yes, conditions can change and you might need to revisit that that uh the question at hand but it's good some something's got to give and so there's just this uh oh relationships mean and navigating those relationships when you compare american business culture with japanese did you uh you speak japanese fluent now I speak to a, a pretty decent level such that I can use it in business. I People comment that I'm fluent. I disagree. Uh, there are significant gaps in my vocabulary, my grammatical acuity. I can get, I can, I can stay out of trouble. Let's put it that way. And this is another example of me being curious. I, I, I will, I want to talk about whiskey in a moment, but yeah, yeah, uh, I keep, I keep talking about shochu and shochu is Japan's, one of Japan's original spirits, one of its indigenous spirits. And I, um, 
I I have I eventually wrote a book about it called the Shochu Handbook, and I during the process of transcripting that book, I came to this really um, you know cold sweat realization. This was probably in two back in two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve. I, I realized, damn it, I am just this weirdo, this weird import who fell in love with this, is just geeking out about these drinks, but I don't have any credentials. Yeah. I mean, I was, I'm a former underage brewer in the States um, making illicit hooch in my home closet. I don't think that's really anything I can hang on the wall. So I started looking for ways to change that. And then, of course, there was a shochu sommelier course with a pretty nasty exam in the whole nine yards. I was like, yeah, found it. Great. So uh, paid for the course, went to these media, these seminar meetings, tastings. I was with other, with a bunch of industry professionals and people working in the trade. It was great tastings, sharing notes, learning some of the history, some of the, the little known trivia that is like, Oh, wow. That's so that's how that works. I didn't realize it was so, uh, so really old school. And I was like, okay, this is going to work. I'm going to be able to do this paid for the, uh, two years prior or like a a bridge version of the test brought it home. Like, okay, let's get to work on getting ready for this test. Open the book. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't read or write Japanese. This is not going to (laughs) work. That was one of the bigger jackass moments of my life. Um, I, cause it wasn't cheap to get all of these materials, I think they were charging like 50 bucks for like what amounted to 20 pieces of paper. Damn. And I was like, damn it. Ooh, okay. So we got to, and, but that wasn't enough to, to knock me off the course. I was like, I really want to get this accreditation because I want to publish this book. And so I paid for the distance learning version of the same course. So I paid for the course twice. Okay. The distance learning version was a couple of thick. I've got one right here. I, I still, I keep it around. Um, it's this, this thick, it's reasonably thick. You can see all the, the, the uh, little things I got stuck in there. And it's two textbooks and then a whole bunch of DVDs that a- accompany the textbooks. And I popped the DVD in boring as and I was like, I can't do this. There was like 12 of the DVDs. Oh, it's no. like, okay, DVDs are out because this is going to bore me to tears. So I just went to the to the coffee, sh- to the cafe with my my Japanese English dictionary and the oh. first textbook, page one. Checked every damn character. And it took me about four hours to do a single paragraph. And then I went back the next day and it took me another four hours to do the second paragraph. And then I'd almost finished the first page. So I was kind of happy with myself. Eventually, because there was so much repetition with the terminology, I was able to do like a page in four hours. And then I was able to do several pages in a couple hours. And then I eventually, over several months, made it through the whole textbook from front to back. Sure. And I re- then I said, okay, I got it. I get it. But I got to be able to read and write this on the test. So I went back to the beginning and I started again. I read the the whole textbook twice from cover to cover. And then I started on the second textbook, which wasn't quite as important. I'll be perfectly honest with you in terms of what I knew was going to be on the test. And then I went and took the exam. It's a four part exam with a tasting in the middle. And they they like spike some of the drinks with oils and stuff. So you're supposed to be able to figure that out before it ever goes into your mouth. Otherwise, you're going to gag. But and I miraculously passed just barely, but I got that damn thing. I learned to read and write Japanese in the process. And then I was able to publish the book. So that was that right there, just learning all of the industry lingo and then learning to be able to do all of, I was from that point on, I was able to email, use email by myself in Japanese, which was huge, a huge change for me and made business so much more streamlined for me. Cause I didn't have to rely on an assistant or on a colleague to get that stuff done for me, but it also took several years off of my life. So I probably will die, um, in 2026. <laughs> oh man. But no, man, that's, I mean, that's awesome of you, dude. I mean, most people, I mean, if it took them four hours just to do one paragraph, they would just, you know, I think we may have said earlier, they would end up saying, nah, this ain't for me, bro. So <laughs> I don't know you do that. But, you know, it was something you were truly, obviously you're passionate about it and you wanted to do that. And you, like you've been saying, you were going to figure it out whether it took you, you know, days, months or years. And yeah, and you did it. 
So it's awesome, man. I, I mean, I really admire that just because I don't see that very often. And I love people who actually sit down and do the, you know, go to the grind and make themselves figure something out, and, you know, and come out great on the opposite end. And But, but I wanna, what I was thinking about while you were talking about that, have you ever seen uh, the documentary called Sour Grapes? No, I haven't. So it kind of goes in line with this. It's a bit relevant, but it's basically more with wine. But this guy, he started to become a big wine aficionado, right? And he yeah. was buying these really expensive bottles of wine. Okay. And so he ended up going to these big, I guess they have big auctions, big tastings and things. And he was getting well known in the wine community. But um, what ha- ended up happening was he started to buy cheaper wines and he was buying these old, you know, used bottles of the old, you know, I guess really expensive wines and pouring the cheap stuff in there and make a new label. Oh, this guy, this guy scammed some pretty big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Big so yeah. And he finally, I know the story. Okay. Yeah. yeah and he finally got caught, but then he was doing yeah. it for a while. And like, you know, I guess no, not really me or not many people could figure out, you know, the cheap wine versus the more expensive wine. And I think finally somebody did catch him like cause of that. They're like, this is, or they didn't make this certain wine then or something along those lines. And they're like, yeah, he might've gotten a little too oh, liberal there. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, and what I was going with that was just because, you know, you're talking about the tastings and stuff and then putting oils in it, just that, you know, I stick to, you know, as far as whiskeys and what I drink, I just stick with what I know. But, and when we start talking about whiskey, you'll probably have to talk to me like I'm five, of course, but no, I doubt that, it. Okay. It's one of those things that, you know, I like certain brands and I just cause it's all one I always buy. But if I were to sit, you know, five shot glasses here and uh, five different brands and try to taste them, I might like one better. But uh-huh. it's me of never doing that. And it's also, I'm not really, I've never considered myself a big foodie or that I have a really great palate. To, you know, when people are talking about taste and smells and stuff, it just doesn't come to me. Or I'm also just very ignorant and don't really know what I'm doing. So <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I think, yeah, developing your palate is just, that's another labor of love that anybody can do. Um, but there are people out there called super tasters and they're kind of on another level. And I'm not one of them. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of one of the normal people who just spends a lot of time thinking about aromas and flavors. That's that's really it. Um, but yeah, that that's st- the sour grapes documentary sounds like a fascinating one. It's a he was he was prolific. He was very, very he had a great palate, obviously, because yeah. he could replicate these and not not just like great wine aromas. He could he could figure out how to make it make it smell and taste like it was decades old exactly with using much far i mean quote unquote inferior wines so that you know he's a bit of a genius who just yeah maybe, maybe took it well took it several steps too far <laughs> yeah but uh yeah it's i'm sure that's a great documentary and i will be looking that up yeah, yeah check it out man it's exactly what you said that i guess he started to get a little bit too greedy and then all of a sudden he was just got got called and i don't even know if he got yeah, sucked into it though. yeah but uh, he's got to be in jail. He burned rich people. They, yeah. I'm sure they locked him up for a good long time. I can't remember how old it is, but it was, uh, it was, it was cool. It was fun to watch. And it was just like, wow, I didn't realize that this you know, type of stuff goes on. I guess it goes on in every sector of every industry or whatever, just a matter of whoever's doing it. But yeah. And yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it does. I'm sure you're right. So, but aside that, but so as far as whiskeys go and everything. Yeah. So as much as I know about Japanese whiskey is I have a, couple friends and there was a popular one here in the states and i think it's kind of rare 12 year old like yaka do you know what I'm... yamazaki yamazaki and yeah i've had a couple tastings of that and it was good i liked it but i think it's a pretty expensive bottle too but oh, yeah. okay yeah and i thought it was kind of rare to get in the states now for some reason it is you can't and you can't get it in japan okay yeah and so but other than that i don't i've never really dabbled a lot in japanese whiskeys and I don't know the differences between, you know, good Kentucky bourbon or whiskey and stuff like that. So I guess that's where I kind of my ignorance is, is uh, starts. So Well, it's I mean, you know what you like. And that's the that's, you know, the this you're 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 on good footing right there. Mm-hmm. And if I could if I were so bold as to summarize Japanese whiskey, I would say that it's it's kind of uh, a shout out to scotch okay. without being without being peaty the the godfathers of of japanese whiskey went to scotland to try and learn how to make it um and i'm speaking specifically about a gentleman named masataka taketsuru who actually helped establish what is now suntory suntory 
writ large, which is a huge company, which owns Beam. And uh, and then later Nika, which are the two biggest whiskey houses in Japan. He had a hand in both of those. And his dream was always to make something in Japan that very closely resembled scotch. And the industry has pretty much followed suit ever since to uh, want to a greater or lesser extent. The Japanese whiskey industry is not old. We're talking a little over 100 years old, I guess. Okay. And it's... It's one where, given access to natural resources, has often had a really, really strong uh, non-Japanese component to it. I mean, a lot of the malted grains have always, most malted grains have always been imported. And so raw materials are not, you know, quote unquote, Japanese. And then also because very different from, if you know anything about scotch, and I'm sure several people listening do, there's a lot of trading of spirit between different companies. They'll they'll barter barrels for barrels to create blends, which does not really happen in Japan or didn't happen until very, very recently. And so what you had was these gigantic whiskey houses that had to come up with their own blends, meaning they had to they had to have their own different distillates that were different enough, different enough to uh, you know, be greater than the, some of the, the parts of the blend. And so there was a, for a long time, and I, there still is, although they're being more transparent about it, a lot of just imported spirit from other countries that was being blended and bottled and called Japanese whiskey, even though it wasn't made in Japan. That's changing. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of folks who are like, well, I'm not a big Scotch fan, so therefore I might not like, like Japanese whiskey. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Japanese whiskey tends to be incredibly balanced and smooth. There's this you know, kind of sparkling, angelic sort of thing around the blending culture here, which I've heard people on both sides of that argument say that it's either, yeah, it's, for, it's legit or it's BS. Mm. Um, but the, the whiskey that we might... Uh, the we do bring one whiskey to the United States that is is uh, it's interesting because it's a hundred percent made in Japan. It's uh, the you know the 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 grains are all well. Okay, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that back. the The grains are sourced in uh, Australia, like a lot of barley is that's brought in here, but it's not actually malted grain. It's brought in as just regular grain and then it's processed here. So starting from, and it's not processed with malt. This is what makes it very different from your typical Japanese whiskey. And I think I'm speaking to bourbon drinkers here. If you like bourbon, then I've got something that might be interesting for you. Uh, it's like, I got a bottle of it right here. It's called, um, Takamine. And this is an eight-year-old whiskey that is made in Fukuoka, Japan. Is that the one? And, I don't want to cut you off, but is that the one from Hanaku Spear? I'll probably pronounce it wrong. Yeah, that's, this is the one that we okay. exclusively import. Because I checked that's out right. your website before we did this, and I actually looked for that bottle. I think you had a location finder, and I was actually looking in my area if there was one just for this episode. I couldn't find one. But In Virginia, yeah. Virginia is yeah. a Virginia is a tough state because I think it's – I think it's a is is it a situation where you have to go to the the state liquor store to get yeah, yeah, get spirits? It's, control, it's a state. control state. Yep. Okay. So that's that's uh, probably why exactly it's so, a little harder to find. We yeah we haven't we haven't had the good fortune to get in front of the board to present this <laughs> brand yet. It's not easy to get that meeting. But anyways, Takamine Eight Year. This is a koji fermented whiskey, and this. This is not malt. This is not made with malted grains. It's made with kojified grains. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this rel relatively quickly, and you're gonna need to use Wikipedia quite a bit. But I, koji, I got, I got I'm ready. You got your pencil. Yeah, I'm ready to take some notes. <laughs> koji is Japan's national mold, M O L D. Okay. And it's used to make pretty much everything that's fermented in Japan, and and everybody you know these things: soy sauce, uh, miso which is like miso soup, yeah. uh, sake, which is what right. most people know about alcohol from Japan, shochu, awamori I mentioned before, and other spirits and other drinks can be made using koji. Koji takes the place of malt. What does malt do? What does malting grains do for making beer or whiskey? 
It's really simple. Inside of grains, they're not like grapes. Grapes are filled with sugar. Grains are not. Makes sense. You have to convert the starch in, in grains into sugar before you can ferment with it. And one way to do that is to malt the grains. Malting is basically, and this is a gross oversimplification, but what you're doing is you're tricking the grains into thinking that they're about to grow into a barley plant. Mm. And when they think it's like the conditions are right, it's time to grow, yay. They convert their own starch, internal starch into glucose for fuel to grow. Sugar is used as energy. So if you can do that, you get the climactic conditions just right. And then as soon as they convert their sugar, their starches into sugar, you slam that process shut with high heat. You can't, you put them in a kiln and then you, then what you have before grape is a sugar ball. Now you have a sugar grain. So you're, then you're in, working with the same, same type of fuel for your fermentation. And then you can crack those grains open and you can start, you can ferment with them. In, in Asia, in much of Asia, there's a similar result, but a very different process. And the process involves koji or some similar mold. All right. And what koji does is, and I know this is super sexy, you can grow this mold on grains, rice or barley usually. And the mold, when it grows on the grain, will insert feeder tubes into those grains and those feeder tubes, which are feeding and, and sustaining the mold, sure. allowing it to, to replicate, they're excreting enzymes that act like scissors and they chop these starch chains into simple sugars. And so by using the mold and, and mold, we, as you know, mold is used and other fu fun, fungi are used, cheese and all sorts of other fermented things that we love. So this, you know, chorizo sausages right it's yeah. it's just an important part of world cuisine and this mold propagation process allows you to not only cut and change starches into simple soluble sugars it also creates a lot of extra flavor and like i said it's used to in almost all japanese fermentation except for maybe beer that being the one standout and so what this particular brand does is that it doesn't use uh, malt, which is a more European or North American tradition, it uses koji, which is a Japanese tradition. And the result of it's it's 100% barley, it's double distilled, and then aged in a combination of ex bourbon casks, mm -hmm. and virgin oak from Missouri, uh, from, you know, oak from the Ozarks, that is shipped to Japan and coopered in Miyazaki Prefecture. Uh, it's a combination of those two different types of barrels blended. And at least eight years, actually it's nine, uh, but we got the labels approved and we didn't want to change it. So, um, <laughs> well, and, uh, and it's, so you get a bonus year in there. Thank you, COVID. And, uh, and it's a really, really interesting drink that is inspired by a gentleman by the name of Takamine. Now, Takamine was the first Japanese person in the history of the world to ever make whiskey, but he wasn't doing it in Japan. He was doing it in Peoria, Illinois in okay. the 1890s. And he very nearly upended the entire American whiskey industry, the spirits industry back in the back before the turn of the century. But a couple of things conspired against him. Number one, he figured out how to make whiskey with, with koji rather than malt. And the people who make malt, the maltsters, were like unhappy because he was going to cut them out of the entire industry. Mm. So they broke into the distillery and they tried to kill him. Damn. They were unsuccessful, but they did succeed to a remarkable degree in incinerating his laboratory, which was in the Manhattan distillery in Peoria. It was the largest distillery in the United States at the end of the 1800s. And they, they managed to destroy just his lab. They didn't touch the rest of the distillery, but they completely destroyed his lab. Set him back a few years, as you can imagine. Oh, shit. The, the authorities didn't hardly even investigate it because oh, it's, a, it's a Japanese guy, whatever. Um, so yeah, it's not hard to believe. And then... Uh, he uh, got back up and running. They were making whiskey. It wasn't called Takamine. It was actually called Banzai. 
But just as they were putting barrels of this Koji whiskey away to sleep for several months, perhaps a short sleep of a, a year or two, the the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was one of Teddy, President Teddy Roosevelt's crowning pieces of legis legislation, was used against the Illinois Whiskey Trust, of which the Manhattan Distillery was a part, to break it up. It was an anti-monopoly uh, piece of legislation, which, of course, is good because we don't like monopolies. Of course. But it completely destroyed the dream of making Koji whiskey in America. So the funny thing is that uh, it's not even funny. It's a remarkable thing is that. Koji whiskey was nearly an American tradition. It wasn't a Japanese tradition. It was nearly an American style of whiskey, if not for having his lab burned down and then yeah. the government shutting them down. This would have been rolled out to all of the Illinois whiskey, the whiskey trust uh, distilleries across the country. They made 80% of whiskey in America back at the end of the 1800s. And they would have switched over to Koji and all of their distilleries because they were going to save so much money. You need less equipment when you use Koji. Koji has higher alcohol percentages in the fermentation. It's more efficient. It's more flavorful. So it's really, we were inspired by his story and we decided to run it back on that. And we worked with a distillery in Fukuoka to not make the same thing because honestly, we're using better ingredients than he had access to <laughs> in the 1890s. Um, but something that's kind of in that vein made with Koji rather than rather than um, malt. And he, despite failing at revolutionizing the American whiskey industry, he did revolutionize life for a lot of people in other ways. He uh -huh. was a chemist um, before moving to the States and, um, and marrying a, an American woman. Sure. And he used his knowledge of Koji and his knowledge of chemistry to create a product called takadiastase, which used the enzymatic properties of Koji to make what was essentially a precursor to like Tums or Rolaids. Hey, okay. So if you had an upset stomach, you could take some takadiastase and it would kind of balance it out and, and make you feel a little bit better. He licensed that to Park Davis, huge pharmaceutical company, made a, made a fortune, moved his family to Harlem, where he had the, a beautiful walk up. And uh, he had a home laboratory because I guess chemists had labs at, at, in that, at that time, un, unregulated laboratories in their homes. And in his home laboratory, in his free time, and this is probably one of the most amazing things that any individual has done in their free time. he. He isolated in his home laboratory medical adrenaline, or what many people will know of oh. as ep epinephrine. Yeah. If, if you know anybody who's ever used an EpiPen, yep. you have Dr. Takamine to thank because the, for the, in the first instance of this in human history, he isolated a human hormone and, and then licensed that to Park Davis and as we know, has saved millions of lives over the past century, thanks to that discovery. Mm. So this, this guy was prolific. He was generous. His generosity extended to Japanese-American relations before the, before the war. He paid for and facilitated the donation of the cherry trees to Washington, D.C., which I know is not far from where you live. Likely. Um, Grant's tomb up in New York, Patterson Park in Baltimore. Wow. Um, you know, funeral at St. Patrick's Cathedral, buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. He was a he was a legend. I don't know who anything. doesn't get the shine that he deserves. But, you know, we hope that we can bring a little more attention to his story through this whiskey that we got permission from his family to name after him. Oh. And uh, that's inspired by by him. So uh, and it's and it's and it's good. I don't think anybody. <laughs> Don't 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 get me wrong. I mean, it's not just the story, and the story is amazing. There should be a movie. There should be a Hollywood film about this. Yeah. But uh, the the you know the whiskey itself is is really really good. If you it's it it's not it's made in Japan, but it's not a Japanese whiskey. How do you right? Mean? Because it doesn't use it doesn't use malted grains. Gotcha. It uses kojified grains. Ooh. So even though it's a hundred percent brewed distilled aged bottled the whole nine yards in japan it's not a japanese whiskey it, we're calling it it's it's a koji whiskey which was inspired by 
the first gentleman living in the States to make the first Japanese gentleman to ever make whiskey. And he was trying to make a koji whiskey. So with any luck, this will become, maybe we'll get some American distilleries. And actually I know of three already who are experimenting with koji. So hopefully this will maybe inspire a regeneration of koji whiskey in the States, which then will be imported back into Japan and close the loop. And we can finally, yep. you know, he'll, his, his experimentation will finally bear fruit. Um, it's, it is a little bit more like, it's kind of a little bit more in the vein of a bourbon. I think a yep. lot of bourbon drinkers really, really enjoy it. Um, so if you can, if, if you can, well, if you want more information about it, like you found on hongkakuspirits.com, huh? you can find a retail locator depending on, on your state. If you're, if you're from Vermont like me, then you're out of luck, but, uh, people in a, in larger, uh, metropolitan areas should have better luck. That makes sense. I mean, what, I mean that your story reminded me of, uh, I hope I don't mess this up. Do you know who Will, William Randolph Hearst was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. I, and I think I'm going to mess this up, but I think he was like, you know, big on paper and stuff. And then, but uh, what's the guy's name who invented hemp? Damn. But he was trying to get the hemp, you know, game going. And then William Randolph Hearst was like, no, I want paper going. And so they got the hemp guy out of there. Like, I can't, now I can't remember his name for nothing. Of course. That, but anyway, but yeah, yeah, but the whole story was like, you know, they, they, you know, downplayed hemp. It was like, no, we don't want it. It's bad. But it was actually, you know, stronger than, you know, pay, you know regular paper and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. For those listening, go look at it or go Google it or Wikipedia. But it's an uh, interesting story how just, you know, these two parties just go at each other and just like, no, I want my brand to oversee the other one. And- yeah, geez, man. And you, you don't, when you're vested interests, right? Jeez. Good luck with that. You better be ready because they're going to come at you now. It's, it, it is next month, the hundredth anniversary of Dr. Takamine's death. I believe he, he passed away on July 22nd. Okay. So it's a, it's kind of an auspicious time in terms of, as far as anniversaries go. And he doesn't, he doesn't get the love that I feel he deserves over here in Japan. Like Kids in elementary school, they don't read about him in their textbooks, really. Ah, that's I take that back. I think they do read about his donation of the cherry trees okay. to Washington, D.C. But otherwise, they don't learn about his scientific achievements. And, and geez, he started one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in Japan uh, called Daiichi Sankyo, which has his fingerprints all over it. He was... You know, just a, I said before, a legendary human. He, the generosity and the humility of this man were unparalleled. He didn't, he didn't want people to know that it was his money behind the cherry tree donation. So he used an official organization to, to facilitate it, but it was totally him. Him and working um, arm in arm with the, the wife of the Japanese ambassador to Washington, D.C., and they they made this thing happen through some official organization, which was, uh, you know, has a, a strong impact to this day. I was just in Washington, D.C. in April, pouring Takamine at the, the Toyota headquarters in, in downtown okay. for, for a party. And when people people hear the story, they're like, that was him. All those beautiful trees were him. I'm like, yep, the entire tidal basin is populated with trees that. Dr. Takamine helped bring over. And it's just, it's a, it's a great story. It's incredibly capped. It's just inspiring. And then when you taste the whiskey, you're like, Oh geez. Yeah. This is when's, when's father's day. I need to get this from my dad. (laughs) Coming up soon. Actually, next Sunday. actually. (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you that, you know, you said sake was the, uh, basically the biggest drink in Japan, but in, that whiskey is what a hundred years old or century old? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's about that's about right. Yeah, has it? In, is it taken over? Have people took to whiskey, just loving it more than their original stuff? It's just becoming a new thing. Part of the whiskey. Culture. Whiskey is huge. Uh, a very very pop. Oh. Highballs are all the rage. You've got, you know, right next to the beer draft, you've got a tap that pours whiskey mixed with sparkling or, or club soda. That's that, you know, you throw a lemon wedge in there and you got a, you got a highball and those are huge and you don't need a good, a really good whiskey for that. Sure. You probably don't want to do, you wouldn't want to bastardize a good whiskey with that. But uh, so there, there's a lot of whiskey consumption. Yes. It doesn't exceed sake consumption, 
um, but show to an awamori consumption due, which is something that surprises everybody when they see the tax numbers every year. Um, show to an awamori have outsold sake every year since about 2003 or 2004. So there's the the drinking culture here is pretty diverse, mm. and, and it is heavily insu- influenced by international styles. And I mean, the entire Japanese whiskey industry is kind of paying homage or homage or however you say that word to the Scotch tradition. Sure. Um, craft beer is is really on the upswing. Sake is fighting for attention. And I think it's doing well because there's been a generation shift in terms of the people that are making it. And shochu and awamori are in that battle as well. Uh, but you've also got this nascent Japanese gin boom. I think the next thing is going to be Japanese rums. Mm. It's a, it's an exciting time to be paying attention, and and then you got the whole food scene, which is just absolutely heavenly. Well, I mean, not only that, but globally, it seems that you know, in my little town here, where I'm at, you know, I'm about three hours south of DC. And okay, we, yeah, we just popped open. Uh, well, not we. I didn't do it, but um, hmm. they just popped open a brewery here, and that was big time for us. And then you know, I, I have a bigger city, well, more of a bigger city above me, and they have they have new breweries, craft beer breweries popping up all the time. So it seems. Oh that, sure. Yeah. So and then you know, I don't know if you ever heard of Asheville, North Carolina, but oh yeah. Yeah, that you know, every time you walk around the corner, there's a new brewery or food spot right there. So. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's one of these things that um, it just seems to be coming up at almost everywhere. Just you know, craft breweries and new styles of alcohol, and yeah, yeah, and and America has a pretty exciting craft distilling culture that's that's sure. really come into its own over the past decade. It's gotten a little bit easier for small distilleries to get licensing, depending on the state, of course, depending on the municipality but it's gotten easier. There's, there's courses out there. There's a lot of mentorship that's available mm-hmm. and a lot of exciting gins being produced. You've got great whiskey popping up all over the place. Um, usually gin arrives before the whiskey cause you need time for the whiskey to age. And, and so like new distilleries will usually come out with a gin before the whiskey yeah, is ready just to keep the lights on. Um, and it's, it is an exciting time and, and America is an incredibly, open field in many cases and you just have this incredible competition and unfortunately that means you're going to see a lot of kind of fly by night here today gone tomorrow outfits yeah just they try to do too much too quickly which is exactly what i witnessed back in the 90s when i was brewing for otter creek we we had an immense competition and then five years later half of them were gone so but, but real um, quick, you kind of need that competition just to make yourself better though in a sense right oh absolutely yeah. and and the winners are the ones who the, the way that we, the, the one of the reasons why Otter Creek still exists today is because they were very clear with their mission statement. And the mission statement was to dominate locally. Oh. Whereas a lot of the competition was like, well, we'll take any opportunity we get. You want to sell our stuff in, in, in Seattle? Fantastic. Let's find a way to do it. And then you're, you know, it's mission creep. You're you're letting your attention get diverted and your energies diverted to other things that are not really within your wheelhouse. And most of our competition spread themselves too thin, and they either were purchased in a fire sale by a larger corporation, or they just went out of business. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, the '90s was the first real wave of immense expansion in the industry, and then there was a adjustment, a readjustment, and a bunch of the chaff was kind of stripped off the off the bottom. And then it's, and it's restarted again because there is the demand for it. And there's a lot of creativity and a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of, a lot of passion. And so you're going to continue to see some exciting things. And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm envious that you have a local, (laughs) a local brewery. I live in in a, one of the largest metropolises in the world. And I don't have one near me, which kind of sucks. Yeah, it's, it's pretty new, but it's, uh, you know, it's really cool places to go out and just, you know, you got a few different beers to go. It's growing. It's getting big. It's been here about a year now, I think. So yeah, that's good. Nice yeah. You just, show. it's fun to support the local, the exactly. local team too. So I agree. yeah. Um, well, Christopher, I got to take this home on that one. Uh, I had a few more questions, but I got to wrap this up because Got something no, we're, absolutely no um if people if you want to plug your stuff if people want to find you all that good stuff um it, i'm it. i'm very easy to track down online uh so christopher pellegrini um that's my handle on instagram and then chris pellegrini on twitter i'm also on i think i do have a page on facebook which i 
update about once a week, mm. uh, which is like, I think it's Pellegrini Christopher because, you know, my private page is Christopher Pellegrini. They didn't allow me yeah. to use the same name for both, but whatever. Um, and then if you, is it all right if I, if I plug a different podcast? Do you plug, mind that? Yeah, plug it, whatever you got to, man. This is your time um, back here, bro. <laughs> oh, cheers. Uh, I, with uh, my dear friend, Stephen Lyman, we have a podcast that focus on ja- focuses on Japanese spirits exclusively called Japan Distilled. So if you're a spirits person or, or you just are curious about part of the drinking culture in Japan, and and let me warn you, we don't really talk about sake or beer because those aren't spirits. Sure. But if you're interested in Japanese whiskey, Japanese gin, Japanese rum, eau de vie, uh, sh- of course, show to an awamori, then Japan Distilled might be a, a good option for you. And we're 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 in our second year. We've got we're close to forty episodes into the journey, and nice. hopefully, hopefully, it serves a purpose. It's a very niche purpose for for a certain sector of the the alcohol loving masses. So, anyways, that's that's me. Thank you very much for the time and for the ability to talk about those things. Oh yeah, thank you, man. I actually never knew that story, and I'm glad you shared it with it now. And I've got that ingrained in my brain now, so I want to make sure I'm able to share it too. And uh, yeah, next time if I ever get up to DC or something, I'm going to look for that bottle. Or if you're there pouring or something, yeah, man, I'll I will be there in September this year. So if you're if you happen to be up that way, come find me, dude. I'll, I'll probably make time for that. So oh, cheers. Yeah, okay. Man, it ain't All no right. drive. I don't mind a little three hour drive. So that'd be awesome, man. But uh, yeah, and there's a great great bar up there focuses on whiskey called Jack Rose. So maybe we can meet there and have a I have mean, a drink. I love it, man. All right, dude. Well, appreciate you again for doing this, man. Enjoy. Well, it. My pleasure entirely. Thank you for for the time. All right, we're out of here, people. See ya.